Ladies, gentlemen, men, faculty members, and my dear fellow students, a very good morning to one and all. It gives me immense pleasure to welcome you all to the 28th annual convocation ceremony of the Gokhale Institute of Politics and Economics. Graduation day is always a day of rejoicing, for it marks the conclusion of an educational journey and the commencement of another more uncertain and more difficult part of one's quest for a better life and future. Truly, today signifies the culmination of many years of hard work in the relentless pursuit of knowledge. Knowledge that will enable a person to embrace opportunities and take on challenges with a clear vision and purpose. I would now like to invite our Registrar Colonel Kapil Jodh to formally declare the commencement of today's proceedings. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of our Chancellor, Dr. Rajiv Kumar, I declare this convocation open. Thank you. Vande Mataram Vande Mataram Sujalam Sufalam Malaya Jashitalam Shasya Shamala Mataram Vande begin this much awaited program today, I now request our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Dr. Ajit Ranade, to welcome Honorable Chancellor of Gokhale Institute of Politics and Economics, Dr. Rajiv Kumar, with a bouquet of flowers. Thank you, sir. I request the Honorable Vice Chancellor, Dr. Ajit Ranare, to welcome Servants of India Society's trustees, Mr. Milin Deshmukh and Mr. Ramakant Lenka, with a bouquet of flowers. Thank you, sir. I now request the Honorable Chancellor, Dr. Rajiv Kumar, to present a bouquet and a memento to our esteemed chief guest for the evening, Lord Meghnath Desai. Thank you, sir. I would like to invite our Vice Chancellor, Dr. Ajit Ranade, to address this August gathering. Thank you, Ananya. Uh, good morning and namaste, everybody. Good morning. <laughs> it's, a, it's a great uh, auspicious day for us as uh, we host the 28th Convocation of Gokhale Institute of Politics and Economics which also uh, is occasion for the 83rd uh, Kale Memorial Lecture. And I'm delighted, privileged, honored to welcome our chief guest uh, for today, uh, Lord Meghna Desai, whom I will, of course, introduce more formally later. And a special welcome, of course, to our own Chancellor, Dr. Rajiv Kumar, 
We also welcome our trustees, Mr. Deshmukh and Mr. Lenka from the Servants of India Society. This is a very, very great occasion. And in the life of an academic institution, the, 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 degree, the, gra the degree granting ceremony has very special place. So at the very outset, let me welcome all of you. Let me you know, join my, my colleagues on the faculty, the, uh, my colleagues in the non-teaching staff, and the f entire family of Gokhale Institute. Uh, a very warm welcome and special congratulations at the very outset to the graduating class. And we, I request all of you, urge all of you, please celebrate in a big way. Taliyon ki bochar honi chahiye. I'm going to uh, say Sanskrit shloka. Please bear with me. Om sahana bhavatu sahana bunaktu sahviryam karvavahe tejasvina vadi tamastu Mad with Vishavahei. Let us <coughs> let us come together. Loose translation. Let us come together. Let us have a common understanding. <coughs> let us have a common learning. Let us have discourse. Let there be not any antipathy between us. Ma with Vishwa. Dvesh. Let there be not any dvesh. So the, the process, this activity of learning is a collective enterprise. We can disagree, we can debate, we can, we can have vigorous dialogue, but it is a common enterprise. It is a collective enterprise. So let us celebrate this. You know, today is the culmination of many of you who went through the hard toil, some for two years. I can see some PhD students here. PhD, when they say PhD student, he has passed out. He really passes out after <laughs> he or she. <laughs> so some of you are going to enjoy the toils of your years of years of labor. And this is the day to celebrate. So um, I congratulate the, uh, uh, the graduating class. And uh, as I said, this is your day for celebration. Don't forget that. And we look forward uh, to, we will have the, uh, the Kali Memorial Lecture followed by the degree ceremony. So uh, over to you, Ananya. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, sir, for those encouraging words. In keeping with tradition at the Gokhale Institute, we are honored to host the 83rd Kale Memorial Lecture. The Kale Memorial Lecture Series has been instituted in the memory of Sri R. R. Kale, who was an ardent follower of Gopal Krishna Gokhale, and in whose memory our institute was established in the year 1930. The Kale Memorial Lecture Series has been delivered by notable thinkers over the last 80 years, in the likes of Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, Dr. Manmohan Singh, P. C. Malanobis, Professor Abhijit Banerjee, and Dr. Raghuram Rajan, to name a few. I am honored to welcome this year's speaker, Lord Meghna Desai, and would now like to invite our Vice Chancellor, Dr. Ajit Ranade, to introduce the Chief Guest for this morning. And I would also request that he give us a few words before that. So we, we will, of course, uh, have a formal introduction of the speaker, uh, of the Kali Memorial Lecture, and our chief guest for today. But before that, I would uh, like to request our <laughs> chancellor, Dr. Rajiv Kumar, to say a few words. Please. <laughs> Uh, Lord Meghnath, um, Professor Ajit Ranade, Mr. Lenka, Mr. Deshmukh, members of the board of the Gokhale Institute, and the faculty here, and all the other staff of the Gokhale Institute, but most importantly, uh, the successful students of the Gokhale Institute, which are passing out today, which are getting their degrees today. Congratulations to you, uh, heartfelt congratulations, and all the best wishes for your career in life and as you go forward. And that's, I think, as has been emphasized, is a day for your celebration, uh, but also for uh, your, uh, your uh, taking a vow, as it were, to do the best in your life and to contribute to the country's development as far as, as much as you can. I just want to say a few words, which is that when, by the time you will be in the prime of your life, which is, let us say, 25 years from now, India would, India, independent India would be 100 years old. And independent India at 100 years old will be a very 
important member of the global community. It will probably be the third, the largest economy in the world. And our aspiration is, and that aspiration you should share, is that our per capita income, we would have transited from being a lower middle income country to an upper middle country, upper middle income country by that time, uh, to a per capita income of $12,000 plus, we hope. And that's, what your, that's where your contribution should lie and will lie. And your contribution will lie also in the fact that while we quadruple our per capita incomes, we will have to reduce our dependence on fossil fuel by almost by a fourth, to become one fourth of what it is. No other country in the world history, I repeat, no other country in the world history, human history, has, has had the challenge to increase its per capita income by this amount and also reduce its fossil energy consumption by that amount. Also, we have to feed the 1.7 billion people who would be there by that time, and our agriculture would require a huge challenge, huge, huge improvement and a paradigm shift. I'm pointing this out to you, friends, yeah, my young friends, that you will have to discover your own models of growth and development and to contribute in a very creative way to the growth of India's future going forward. So please become thinkers today. Uh, please think of yourself not as the back office of the world, but as the front office of the global economy, which will lead the world uh, towards a new future in many ways. So that's your challenge. Can you be the leaders, the thought leaders for the world in the next 25 years? Because I'm sure you can be, and I look forward to the time when some of you will blaze trails, blaze you know, glorious trails of success and, and, and creating new forms of entrepreneurship, new forms of energy uh, you know, provision, and a new paradigm for Indian agriculture going forward. My very best wishes to you again, and I hope you will succeed as only success can. Thank you, and best wishes again. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Rajiv Kumar. Actually, as you know, he was at the highest levels of policy making in India until recently. He was vice chairman of Niti Aayog for almost five years and worked with the highest levels. And before that, of course, he has been involved in various capacities across multiple functions. I don't want to recount that. Also that he's got two PhDs in different fields. So uh, we are very delighted to have him as part of our family. Please give him a warm applause, Dr. Rajiv Kumar. <clears throat> We, uh, we will proceed to the next part, of, uh, but before that, I just want to mention that because we are graduating actually two batches, this is, we are coming after post-COVID first time in a, in, a, in a big way, so we have had to restrict uh, uh, participation by parents and friends and well-wishers, and they are seeing uh, this uh, live stream in, in the rooms are joining and, of course, online. So a special hello to them, and uh, we are sorry we couldn't accommodate everybody in this auditorium. So uh, we, we acknowledge that and, you know, this is the, I guess this is a sign of growth. So at some point we'll have to do it in a bigger place. I also want to acknowledge the presence of our board member, Dr. Anand Deshpande, who is here. Uh, and of course, uh, our mentor, Captain Chitre. And very importantly, our former director, Professor Vikas Chitre, is here. Thank you, sir, for being here today. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, it is my, again, privilege and uh, honor to uh, introduce the chief guest uh, who will be delivering the 83rd Kale Memorial Lecture. Uh, as you know, the, on, on, on my left is the portrait of uh, uh, Rao Badur Kale, who gave uh, a donation initially to set up the institute. And the founding director, uh, Dr. Gargil, is uh, on, on, on my right. So this Kale Memorial Lecture tradition is a very rich tradition, and we have had uh, the lecture delivered by none other than people like Dr. Ambedkar, uh, then uh, I think Mr. Mahal Nobis, uh, Dr. Manmohan Singh, uh, President Abdul Ab APJ Abdul Kalam. So this is a very, a very distinguished tradition, and we are happy that we have 
Lord Meghnath Desai with us today. So I will just say a very few words by way of introduction uh, because uh, uh, as you know, if you go to his Wikipedia page, you'll realize that reading his Wikipedia it's page itself be a one long lecture for me. But I want to give you a tidbit. In uh, December 2008, you know, uh, in September was the, the, the big crash of Lehman Brothers and the global financial crisis. The young students of financial economics will appreciate this. So in December 2008, there was a very major international conference at the London School of Economics, uh, where the, one of the chief guests was uh, the late Queen Elizabeth. So she came and she asked a very simple uh, and appointed question to the galaxy of uh, economists and Nobel laureates who were there. He said, uh, she said, how come none of these economists were able to predict this great financial crash, you know, whose effect we are feeling up to this day? It's a very simple question. How come you guys did not, you are all expert economists, how come you did not anticipate this? Well, it, it turns out that even to this day, we don't have a good enough answer, but I'm happy to say that there is one book uh, written by uh, Lord Meghnath Desai, and which I must uh, recommend to all of you. It's called Hubris. H-U-B-R-I-S, which was published, I think, a few years back, which actually uh, tries to not just explain this crisis, but takes a historical perspective of uh, uh, the economics, you know, the processes in economics, world economy, global economic dynamics, over a much longer time period. But it is not a technical book of full of jargons and graphs and, and, and models. It's actually, it lead, reads very, very smoothly, like, uh, almost like reading a novel. So I would highly recommend this book uh, as, as what an economist or even the lay person, public should read. This book, by the way, is one out of 45 books that Lord Meghna Desai has written. And uh, out of those 45 books, of course, uh, I mean, I could go on and on in his introduction. I wanted to keep the introduction informal rather than reading out his... Uh, so among the many books that he's written are also, I think, three novels, two or three novels, fiction. Uh, there are two books on Bollywood. He's probably the country's number one expert on Dilip Kumar. Uh, and uh, he, uh, another interesting tidbit was that, uh, uh, you know, he's written a book on Marxian economics, which has become a standard textbook. I think it is published in 1974. So much so that uh, his uh, knowledge of Marxist economics, that, such that his teacher, the great Professor B.R. Brahmananda of Bombay University, uh, Dr. Desai is a student of Bombay University, what was called Bombay University then. So the, the late uh, Professor Brahmananda, he was talking to uh, one of uh, uh, Britain's finest eco women economists, Joan Robinson. I think Joan Robinson is the kind of an example where the Nobel Prize missed out on her. So she used to visit India, so she was in Bombay and, Brahman, and she was a Marxian economist. So uh, Brahmananda told uh, Joan Robinson, you know, my student knows more, more Marx in economics than you do. So that was quite a bold thing to say. And that student was, of course, Meghnath Desai. So I'm, I mean, of course, as I said, he's uh, been a member of the House of Lords uh, in, in the UK for the last 34 years. He was also been the president of the uh, Labour Party, but in his own constituency, not the entire Labour Party of the UK, but in, in his constituency for many, many years. Uh, he's been a uh, professor at London School of Economics. He's now an emeritus professor there. He also chairs a, an academy in his name, Meghna Desai Academy of Economics, which is also the, offers a one-year postgraduate diploma. He's uh, on some international commissions for international financial flows, I, I mean, and so on and so forth. Uh, studied under uh, people like Larry Klein back in, uh, in his PhD days. And uh, very, very, uh, what should I say, uh, loyal alumnus of Ruya College of Mumbai and Bombay University. So uh, please put your hands together to welcome Lord Meghna Desai. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Ajit. Uh, that's what friends are for. Uh, now, first of all, I'm very grateful to be invited to this great institution. This is my first visit to the Gokhale Institute of Economics. Uh, I'm also very thrilled that this is the 83rd Kale lecture. It's also my 83rd year of life. So I had to wait 83 years to, to, to get to the Kale Memorial Lecture. That's very good. 
And of course, uh, my friend Vikas Chitra is here, uh, whom I last saw 60 years ago. So we were students together in Bombay, being taught by Pierre Brahmananda. And he went to Rochester, I went to Pennsylvania, and we haven't met all these years. So I'm very glad that I got here to be able to meet Vikas Chitre. So those are the most important things. Now I'm sorry to say that uh, you have to suffer one more lecture in your life. That, that is a cost. That's the cost of getting your degree. Otherwise, we won't give you any degree. Uh, I won't examine you after uh, my lecture. Uh, so you can, you can rest assured. Uh, I, I also have to say that the Gokhale Institute for us outsiders was always known as a institution. We didn't just do academic economics, but it always did practical social research in Indian conditions. It was a much more Indian institution than my own uh, uh, alma mater, Bombay was. Bombay was sort of an applied economic institute, but uh, uh, Professor Gargill, whom I had a great chance of meeting in Philadelphia many years ago, they were always known as people who actually consider on Indian reality in a very concrete way. And that is where, of course, the great work by Dandekar, uh, Professor Dandekar, uh, Dandekar and Rath, uh, the essay on poverty in India. Now, it's a very interesting question that we had planning in India for 15 years, 20 years nearly uh, by then. But nobody had measured poverty in India. We had a Mahalanobis Commission in 1960 to examine the effect of distribution of income due to planning. That, that report sank without trace. I haven't read it. If I haven't read it, nobody else has read it. I can tell you that. And so uh, it is astonishing that we didn't actually concentrate on poverty to begin with. And my theme today is basically it's also astonishing that poverty doesn't happen to be the main theme of economics, uh, and which, which, which it ought to be. Because I think what the pandemic taught us, and pandemic taught me anyway, uh, that basically a pandemic was a situation in which no economic theory applied. Because we had a situation in which it was not a Keynesian situation where uh, there was supply, but there was no demand. And then you let some people dig ditches and give them money, and they spend money, and then uh, they, the money they spend sold goods, and then the multiplier process took place. That is all right. So we, had, we have the theory for that. We may even have a theory of supply deficiency and demand being uh, quite uh, large, and that's sort of the development problem. The development problem is that we can't supply enough goods and services to have to give our uh, citizens a, a good income. That's pretty straightforward. Uh, I mean, it's not as straightforward as as uh, Rajiv Kumar said. This is going to be your problem, not our problem. We we have made the mess. You'll have to cure it. But uh, that problem is uh, familiar. What we didn't know is a situation in which neither supply nor demand exist. We had a supply breakdown and we had a demand breakdown. And a number of countries had to cope with giving pe away money to people from deficit budgeting and so on in order for the economy to function. We also became aware that sheer human contact is a problem. And we, at least in, in the UK where, uh, where I live, we had to ban all sorts of good activities like going to the pub, going to restaurants. We can't spend money without human contact. We had never thought about that. Proximity is a requirement in economic life. We, we never studied that. But we could not afford proximity because we had an infectious disease. There's an old expression, uh, we, are in, we are all in this together, which is, politicians always say when they're about to put up your taxes or something like that. Now, we, 
We're all in this together. And one way to think of economics is, are you protecting lives and livelihoods? The first and only question economics ought to able to be faced. Uh, are we protecting And so I started thinking about uh, that during the pandemic. And I realized that something was wrong with economics. So I've written another book called Poverty of Political Economy. And I'm going to try and tell you a little bit about that. <clears throat> the problem is that uh, when <clears throat> Adam Smith was writing, I know nobody has read Adam Smith, but I have read him many times. And I do advise you, if you ever have time to read Adam Smith, he's probably still the greatest book in economics ever. He had a lot of sympathy for how to uh, make the broad majority more prosperous. The wealth of nations is not about the wealth of uh, the rich nations, the wealth of poor nations. The, wealth, the nation in the title is the nation of people. And the idea is how can more people be made prosperous? The whole emphasis changes in the next generation of people like Ricardo and Malthus because economics certainly becomes very hostile to the poor. And the reason why it happened is, is uh, if I may just uh, tell you, in the uh, 19th century, <coughs> actually in the 18th century, there was a law in England that nobody should be starving. Each parish, each uh, sort of district, each parish had the responsibility to make sure that anybody who could work had work and had a wage. And anybody who could not work, who because of disability, old age or disability, was called a pauper. Pauper was maintained by the local gentry who had the money to give to the church. The church collected the money and they were fed out of this. So that that, that a scenario. And suddenly the prices of uh, Wheat rose for some uh, exam uh, from reason. Inflation was there, and this whole system broke down. Rates had to be increased to feed not just the paupers but also the workers. So suddenly, economists started worrying about what does it cost for a worker to be uh, employed, and so something called the labor theory of value came up. And labor theory of value said, what is a worker worth? What is the value of a worker? The value of a worker is the amount of bread he and his family require uh, to survive. Okay? Uh, and the price of bread was known. And how many hours of another laborer's work does it take to produce this bread? So the bread that nourishes the worker and his family is the basic wage. And the amount of time it takes to produce that wage is the value of that worker. So the value of a person was being measured in the value of the food he eats, and that of the minimal food. And that became the labor theory of value. And everybody was very happy that at last we had a theory of value, how are things are valuable. And then the whole uh, uh, sort of, you know, science built on that. Now the interesting thing about that was that it was in the interest of the people doing economics in that generation, uh, Ricardo and Malthus especially, to minimize the value of, you know, the amount of bread workers had to eat because they were paying the tax. The tax was being paid by the rich. And the rich were in charge of political economy. So the rich decided that they had to minimize the amount of wage the workers needed to be able to work. Now, given the way things are in the world, of course, Ricardo was an amazing, amazing man. A great economist, one of the richest men of his days. He was a stockbroker, he was a landlord, he, he owned lots of property. He had one thing, he was a businessman, but he had no, no patience for real life complications. He was a great logician. He decided, forget about all complications, 
just decide how much does uh, making a bread cost in terms of labor time. That's the value of labor, and that, and that is uh, uh, the wage should be the value of labor, period. And then Malthus came to his uh, help, as it were, and said, if you pay more to these people, you know what they do? They will breed. They will have more children. So we have to prevent them having children because if they breed more, we will have to pay greater tax. I'm, I'm, I'm seriously not uh, uh, simplifying, but I I'm, I'm have to shorten this thing because uh, Malthus wrote a book called An Essay on Population, became very famous, which said population increases geometrically, 2, 4, 8, 16. But uh, food supply increases arithmetically, 1, 2, 3, 4. Well-known thing. He was a mathematician. He had a mathematics degree uh, at Cambridge. So everybody believed that he knew some, something about it. It's a completely fabricated number completely fabricated formula, and when he was living, there was evidence that what he was saying was completely false. And despite five editions of his book, he never changed this formula. And uh, some other people said, you know, like William Hazlitt, who was an essayist. But the purpose was that at that time, this is now 1790s and then uh, 1800s, the French Revolution had started. And the people in England, the, the, the parliamentarians and the and landlords and so on, they very afraid that the people will rise in England and threaten their hold on politics. So they said, in those days, only 2% of the population had the right to vote because you had to be a taxpayer, a large taxpayer, and only men had the vote, not, not women. So those 2% thought that property was in danger, so we had to keep control of the people. So political economy became involved in this particular conspiracy against the people and said, labor's theory of value is what is the value, Anything else doesn't matter, and therefore we shall, we shall regulate the wage because the wage should not go any beyond the amount of labor time which it takes to make bread, more or less. Now, the consequence of this is that economics, political economy, whatever you call it, become very hostile to the poor. A, wages should not rise because wage rise causes population growth. And secondly, government should not get into debt. Deficits are wrong, because basically the rich had to pay uh, the taxes. So budgets must be balanced. And money supply must be controlled, because if there is inflation, the price of bread will go up, and who will suffer? Suffer would be the people who uh, own, the f own the farms and land because they have to sell the uh, uh, crop and of course the price rises, they will lose money. So the whole nature of economics became very much the idea that economics, the way value is measured and the way value should be regulated should make quite sure that wages don't increase too much because it is not good for the economy, but much more, it's not good for the worker himself to have high wages. Now, in a sense, this particular uh, uh, philosophy not only prevailed, but even today, you would find people who are very left-wing, who are Marxists or Ricardian, neo ricardians or whatever it is, they're very proud of the theory. Labor theory of value is an objective theory, they tell you. The new theory of marginal economics and utility and all that, that is subjective. That is, that is no, we have to go back to labor theory of value. Poor, poor Karl Marx was fooled by labor theory of value all his life. Now, it didn't occur to me, I, I, after 60 years of doing economics, it didn't occur to me what the fallacy was. But the fallacy had political roots. I discovered in my leisure that normally people say economic is the basis and politics is the superstructure. 
No, in this case, it was politics was the base and economics was the superstructure that these people made up very big, very clever people. They made up a story. And so our, our uh, tradition in economics all these years has been to reduce poverty to some number, some simple number, which is the minimum amount a poor needs to live. Our whole notion of poverty is, what is the minimum we can get away with paying the poor? All they have to do is eat. There's no other function for which we need to pay money to the poor. So, you know, I mean, that's the way, that was the approach, and of course with the, with the you know, universal franchise and popular governments and democracy and so on. Government were responsible for maintaining these sorts of uh, standards of living of people. But how do they do that, especially if it's been made out of taxation? Well, what is the minimum we can get away with? So we measure poverty in that way. And um, in India, of course, there's a great tradition of poverty measurement, you know, and there are a lot of discussions about what are the relevant retail prices in different districts and, and how many, you know, how do you account for families and all sorts of, you know, very, you know, very sincere, clever people have tried to improve the measure of poverty. And a place like World Bank wants a simple number, dollar a day or something like that, you know. They, they, they don't, they're not actually interested in that. They just want something they can advertise uh, as, it, as being discovered, dollar a day or whatever it is. Now, the problem is that can we not stop all that and think of the poor as people? And first of all, like, what is it that people need to have an adequate life? And what is adequate life? It is not just eating. Life is more than that. And luckily, some people have done some work on that. I'll only describe one or two because, you know, uh, time is short and uh, you have uh, degrees to receive, uh, which is more important than anything I say. Uh, so one approach was done by a sociologist, uh, a man called Peter Townsend in the UK. And he did a survey. He listed sort of items of daily consumption, uh, you know, like it, now this is, this is a British uh, tradition. The tradition is a, a Sunday roast, Sunday roast beef on Sunday. It's a kind of tradition. So have you had roast beef on Sundays? Have you had fresh vegetables? Have you had, so he made a list of things people would normally eat in a society and asked, had a survey of families, not on how much they, they spend, how much they earn, and all that. What did you eat? And once so the, he was still with the eating stuff, the idea was that you belong to a society if you can take part in the activities other people in society, majority in society can enjoy. If you can't enjoy what the majority enjoy, you are poor. You're isolated, you're neglected, you're the poor. So think of the poor as, uh, do they feel like they belong to society or not? Now that's a very different way of thinking about poverty than, and than the standard way. And then of course Amartya Sen, whose name is familiar, he said basically the poor are actually, one poor person is different from another poor person because poor have different abilities, they have different aspirations, just like the others have different abilities. So if, for example, I am disabled and I can't walk, I may need a, uh, uh, some sort of disability, some, some wheelchair or something like that. Even if I'm even in my poverty, I need a wheelchair to be able to get about because getting about is a very basic activity to all human beings. Or I may need a hearing aid or I may need special glasses. Or, so in order to fulfill my potential, uh, my capabilities, as he called it, 
I have capabilities and I would like to fulfill my capabilities. I will choose how many capabilities I fulfill. I mean, you may have the same as I do, but I may choose, say, I may only want to do music, uh, and, and I may need help for that because I'm deaf. And I, I, I need, so, so think of individuals as different, and each has potential or has capabilities. And ask your question, what is it that a person needs to fulfill as much of their potential as they want to? If you think about poverty like that, it's a very different perspective from uh, bread. And so the task of economics has to be think of the poor more as us than as them. And my uh, researchers basically convinced me that, of course, Malthus and Ricardo did whatever they did. They were clever people. But they also lived in an undemocratic society. And the people who were in charge were not interested in the people who are outside the democratic system. Now we have universal franchise. And therefore we are, as politicians or whatever, responsible for everybody's uh, welfare because everybody is a voter, every adult is a voter. So can we somehow uh, pay attention to the whole population and think of the whole population as similar people, people just like us. You know, in India there is this uh, now expression, specially abled people. They're no longer called disabled, they're called specially abled people. So let's specially, uh, specially rich people or specially uh, you know, uh, endowed people. Can we somehow think of the economic problem and how can we raise the welfare of all people? And therefore not worry about the debt GDP ratio or things like that, but start with the idea that we not to have, uh, of course, uh, we will measure per capita income, we'll measure poverty standards, we will measure inflation, but the purpose of economic, of political economy or economic, what do we call it, is to make quite sure that lives and livelihoods uh, are protected and enhanced. And economics has got to actually more, uh, be more oriented to thinking about living people rather than thinking about numbers and diagrams and things like that. And so one thing economists have to do, and that's my, you know, uh, I never like my elders giving me advice. So I know I should not be giving advice, but what the hell is my, my, my chance uh, to get away with it. I think going around, keep your eyes open. Look around, because economics is all about living people and about what they do and what they cannot do. And unless you actually observe people and see how they live, what they do and how they can do things better than what they can do right now. You won't be good economists. So on that little advice, I will leave you and enjoy your success. I congratulate your parents for having suffered all the hardship they had to do to put you through. And, and uh, uh, so I thank them as well for supporting you while you were students. And I wish you all good luck and all you may prosper. Thank you.